The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 223. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Welcome back to the EL. Today we have Scott Stratton, author of Unselling, The New Customer Experience. And I got to tell you right off the bat before we jump into this interview, out of 223 plus interviews, this is one of my top, my favorite interviews. You can always just tell when someone's being, uh, uh, when they just open up and tell you exactly how it is. And and there's some paradigm shifts <laughs> coming your way in this interview. And Scott Scott's a phenomenal guy. He writes a great book and, and a fantastic speaker. So I can't wait for you to listen because I think no matter what industry, uh, what kind of entrepreneur you are, there is something that you can get out of this book. So let's bring on Scott. Welcome, Scott. And thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Before we take a deep dive into your book, Unselling, will you take just a moment to introduce yourself? Tell us just a little bit about you personally. Well, I'm the un-everything. Uh, it's unmarketing, unselling, co-host of the Unpodcast, and unsatisfied with the way things were being done in business. That's awesome. So first off, thank you for sharing that. And we'll jump into your latest, I guess, what you, from what you were saying, your unbook, which is Unselling, The New Customer Experience. And I think the first thing that comes to mind, you know, and I told you beforehand, uh, before we jumped on here about how my marketing guy had, had first told me about you is, is that I think today we're going we're gonna to change or, or create some paradigm shifts for people. So I'm really exciting. So let's jump into that book, which was uh, made available not that long ago, actually September of 2014. And yeah. Scott, oh, I was just going to say, we're going to move quickly. Yes. But we're really here to cover the the top questions that our listener and future reader would like to get answered. And the first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing Unselling? It got to the point where I realized that being a old school sales and training manager uh, back in the day, uh, every, the sale was focused on the transaction. You put all your eggs in the sales basket. And once you had the transaction, we handed it off to some other department, operations, customer service. And that's where we kind of dropped the basket and all the eggs broke. So the point I was trying to make was everybody's in sales. Everybody's a part of it because the way to lead to future sales is to make sure that we make the customer ecstatic to be part of our organization. And that means from who answers the phone to helps out with customer issues to delivery, if it's an actual tangible product, everybody's in sales, especially those people even on the front line who don't get paid the most or appreciated the most. Yeah, that's absolutely huge. And so you've already, in my eyes, you've already differentiated the book a little bit from others that are out there. But I think this question is so relevant because there's hundreds of books that come out every single month uh, that are applicable to salespeople or entrepreneurs in general. So what makes your book different from others regarding the same or similar topic? It has no cover. That's It's a blank cover for the most part, which is that alone has to make it stand out from every other book out there. It has the word unselling stamped in the bottom right corner, and there's no author names. There's no um, crazy clip art graphics. And especially, and probably the most important, our faces are not on the cover. And that's really what drives us apart from a lot of business books. Nobody's given the double gun finger salute. Nobody's uh, <laughs> holding their cell phone to their ear. And this is really, there is a point to that. So myself and Allison, my better half, and every sense of the imagination and the co-author of the book, we decided that the focus has to be on what they're doing, not us. And that was the point where in the book, that's what we say as well. It's not about you. It's about the customer. That the brand is not about what we think it is. It's what the customer. And that book had to reflect that. And now in a sea of book of terrible faces on them, ours stands out nicely with just plain white cover. That's incredible. I like when someone's when someone's thought process runs completely through everything they do. I mean, it, from, the, from the second you've jumped on the interview and, uh, and up until this point, everything's lined up, which is, yeah. which is amazing. But well, tr try to sell, try to sell a blank book cover to a publisher. And uh, that's a <laughs> fascinating experiment, by the way. <laughs> well, what's funny is I guess I, I have it pulled up on Amazon and I didn't take a, a deep look into the cover. So I was like, what, what? So I looked it up on the other, I was like, no, he, he's, yeah, that's exactly what it is. How did I not recognize that? that that's hilarious. But Thank so you. how did you guys write the book to be read? And I guess simpler stated, you know, is this a book that they can jump in, the reader can jump in, jump out, cherry picking information and yeah. ideas, or did you yeah. really design it to be read from front to back? No, it's it's been written like uh, on marketing was written. That means very short sections. There's actually 61 chapters. And uh, the point is, it's, a, it's the same length of, of a regular 
business book, but it's 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 written in a way that that we like to talk and that we like to read, which is uh, you, you pick those nuggets out of what you like, and you can read it straight through. Um, it has a theme throughout the whole thing, obviously, but um, you can take a little bit here, take a little bit there. What I'm trying to say in a weird way is you can read it in the bathroom, no problem. Mm. <laughs> That's perfect. That's the best kind of reads, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Scott. So now that we know a little bit of the background, the purpose behind the book, let's take a deep dive into the content itself. So we take the next five to eight minutes and really give the future reader, the person who's listening right now, a great idea of what your book's all about. Well, the the main um, pillar of unselling is the customer pulse. And that is that people think we have two types of uh, people in this world. We have customers and we have non-customers, or we have clients and non-clients. And we just say, okay, we're, we're once we have them, we have them. And business sales became dating. We did everything possible to court somebody. We did everything possible to date them. You know, we, 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 we went to the gym, we got our hair done, everything else. And then we finally, you know, became married to them. And we got them as a client. And then they went to the wayside and off we went to find the next one. And the key thing with the pulse is that we have three types of customers. Ecstatic static and vulnerable ecstatic type of clients are the ones that refer others the ones that renew if we're on a yearly plan with somebody or a monthly plan the ones who sing our praises in social media regardless of if we're on there or not static customers who are in the middle those are the customers who are there they're probably going to renew they'll come back they'll keep buying but you know they could go either way about the product just that really this customer is our customer because they haven't seen or heard of something, a better solution, or it hasn't been so good that their resistance to change has trumped that complacency, the ability to sit there. The vulnerable customers, those are the ones that are looking for an out. Now, this this process could be a day, it could be a year, it could be five years, depending on how high the purchase price of something is, how high the trust is. You know, for a real estate agent or uh, buying a car, Uh, For me changing, it takes a lot of trust for me to go somewhere else, but I will and can go. Same thing with banking or um, finance. But if it was somebody who would, um, let's say, I go eat at a restaurant, it doesn't take me a lot to want to leave and be vulnerable and walk out the door. The key with us with taking is is actually taking the customer pulse and finding out where are they? Where are they on the ground? The problem is we don't find out we've lost a customer or client usually until we've lost them. And then we do everything possible to try to get them back. My, my, my cable provider up here where I am in Toronto uh, has a, um, a save team. They're literally called a save team where if I complain about – there are cable for TV and internet and they provide home phone as well, that I will only get a deal from them. We've been conditioned that I only get a deal from them if I say I'm leaving. And then they'll <laughs> come back to me and say, oh, well, he can give you this, this, and this. But if you just gave me that – when I initially complained, I wouldn't even walk out the door. And that's the, this is the problem that it actually goes back to my HR days, my human resources days. I used to be in HR. I had to get out of the industry because I realized I, had a, uh, I hate people. So that was, a, <laughs> that, that was a mistake to be in that field. And I'll admit that was on me. But here's the thing. We, we let performance reviews that we do, supposed to be doing yearly or every six months, we let that kind of slide. Nobody ever really did them. But exit interviews were mandatory. That in HR, we had to ensure that no matter what, we had to do an exit interview, which is if anybody, everybody's experienced or, or done one, tell us what we could have done eight months ago to keep you with us. It's the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard in business. That tell us what we could have done that we can't do anything about now. And that's the same thing we do in sales. We start scrambling. It's like breaking up with somebody. You know, I can be better. I can do better. No, just be better, period. Be better at these things. And that's the problem. We can't, we have this cyclical thing in in business and in sales where we overpromise and underdeliver. That has become the motto. Promise whatever you can, whatever discount, whatever turnaround time, whatever features, so we can get the sale, so I can make my quarter. And then it just all falls apart afterwards. And we leave operations and customer service to pick up the slack from that. And that's partially because of our compensation system, the way we've been done, partially because of how we pressured things, whether it's a public company, whether it's just simply a demands we've got in business. We have to understand that customers can be customers for life if we just value them and ensure that what they want 
is not the moon and the stars and the sky. What they want is what they paid for. And the problem is we've promised a lot when they pay for it. So that's where the book goes is a um, between examples of how we've personally experienced it to examples that are out there in the uh, in the world to then practical things of, okay, so how do you do that? How do you take a simple thing like asking and finding out where you stand that we had a, um, a private school that was a client we used to do consulting and they said, we're losing students. And this is students that have, you know, five figure tuitions and a very small enrollment. And they said, the problem is we lose a, a student after they've left. And, I'm, and I, I looked at them, I said, have you ever asked the parents how, how they're feeling, what they're thinking about the school? And they're like, they looked at me like I was, I was some kind of foreign object. <laughs> they're just like, what do you mean? Ask them. I mean, ask them. And they're like, well, how would you do that? I said, you just give them three words, stop, start, continue. And this theory goes all the way back to the to online marketing to the first book is simply putting it out there. Instead of waiting till it's on Yelp or TripAdvisor for some companies, we asked them, said, why don't you ask the parents? And we sent out a survey on email, said, what should we stop doing? What can we start doing? And what should we continue doing to ensure that your child's education is not only great, but also here? And in 24 hours, we got 98% response to that survey. Oh, wow. 98%, and that's in a day. Now, I understand the parents have a very high vested interest. This is not like doing a survey for somebody who bought a, a, a chocolate bar. But it shows you that they were, they were dying to give their feedback if they were only asked. And we sat down with a binder around their executive table and, and assigned every single thing that was brought up to ensure because the key to asking for feedback is then acting on the feedback as opposed to just asking for it and not doing a thing with it. So... At the end of the day, it's really the, the customer rules and the client rules. And now that the, and the, and we had, on the other side of it, we dive into, just dive into social media stuff about, you know, it's the great, it's, we almost called the podcast, by the way, we almost called it, you know, the customer strikes back. Like it was just like, it was going to be like the, one, the part of the trilogy that was going to be like, it, it's it, your time's up. It's been a good run companies, but now we have the floor. And that's the point, which is, the problem is it's not all social media things in the book where people would think it would be, well, how do we, how do we stop bad Yelp reviews or how do we stop bad t- people are tweeting, you know, angry against us? How do we stop that, Scott? And people have asked that. And I, I keep looking at them with this puppy dog, t- you know, tilted to the side look, which is you don't have a social media problem. You don't have a, a review problem. You have a business problem. Mm. They're just manifesting themselves on these channels. You don't have to be everywhere in social media. I can't be everywhere. I, I, I don't have a job. Like my only job is to keeping up with social media platforms and digital world, and I can't. And that means you don't have much of a hope. The, the key is listening, seeing what's going on, but then being willing to act on fixing it so that that megaphone that is things like online and, and uh, digital quiets down and goes into your favor by creating business change. And that's the summary of it, really. Scott, you did a fantastic job. And there are so many things that, I, you know, I own a sales company and we sell IT products, but again, it is a sales company. And uh, there's so many things that I'm going to need to re-dive back into. Mm. I, uh, one of the reasons why I love books, and that's why this podcast is all about books, is the, is the paradigm shifts that they bring. And because every time a book has, has given me a nugget or, or created a paradigm shift, my life, finances, whatever, have moved forward. And there's a couple right. things you said that I kind of checked myself on like, oh, wait a second there. <laughs> I think someone left a review on somewhere and I uh, I had a similar response to that, you know, so this is uh, fantastic. And now, you know, I kind of feel like this questions mean sometimes because I'm asking you to to take everything you just said and everything in your book and put it into one thought. And that's if the reader could only take away one concept principle or action item out of your entire book, what would you personally want that to be? I really have to, I really have to pull a chapter out of this for you to, to make it make sense, which is there's a chapter about Air Canada versus WestJet. Those are the two, you know, national airlines we have in Canada when Air Canada acts like a monopoly. I flew, I was their super elite flyer three years ago or 125,000 miles on that airline. I went from 125,000 super elite to this year I'm at 20,000. And why I say that is the chapter about Air Canada versus WestJet, as I'm reading it and going through it and adding some thoughts to the chapter as we're writing the book, I'm on a WestJet flight in the front row. And 
onto the uh, the plane, gets a guy with a kind of a suit and tie. And that's not my thing, but hey, he's wearing a suit and tie. That's his thing. He gets on and he goes over to the flight attendant and says, hey, I'm the uh, VP of operations for WestJet. And uh, I'm going to be helping you on this flight today. And he sits down and he smiles and everybody's, and she's smiling. I'm like, what's going on? As soon as we hit altitude, we take off. He rolls up his dress shirt sleeves and he starts helping with the drink service. Hmm. And I'm like, what? And I, I, I'm on this chapter. I'm, I'm adding notes to the chapter and it's like a real time thing. And I look at the flight attendant. I'm like, is this normal? She goes, they all do it. Every executive does it. Wow. So when they get on the plane, it's not like, ooh, be on your best behavior. Our, our parents are home. It's, oh, we have more help today. And then, of course, I got in touch with them after. You have no idea who's sitting on your flight. It could be somebody working on a book about customer service. And But that why I say that is, I mean, ev- the moral of that story is everybody matters. Yeah, Everybody in the chain matters. And I, I can't tell people what the ROI is of being better at business because there is no exact one. I just know if, I, if you have two planes going to the same place and I enjoy your experience better, when it goes wrong or when it goes right, that's where I'm going to go. And it, from 125,000 miles to 20,000, that's got to tell you something. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic takeaway. And you've said so many things throughout this interview that are that are quote worthy, things that, that have been written down. And that's actually my next question, which is, do you have a favorite quote from your book? Something that you wrote that has resonated with, uh, with those that have read it so far, or maybe it's even something that you wrote that you personally love. And we take a second to explain what it means to you. Well, there is a, a chapter um, about a company called uh, Big Ass Fans. And I absolutely love this company. I'm actually going to, amazingly enough, with somebody with an ego like me, uh, that I'm actually going to quote somebody else. And uh, Carrie Smith, who's the founder of Big Ass Fans in Kentucky, they pay 30% higher than the state average in pay for their employees and um, um, uh, 25% higher than a federal pay for, their, for everybody that works there. They kept everybody on during the recession and they make fans, literally. They make big ass fans. <laughs> and he said a quote that has stuck with me forever. He says, you treat your customers and your employees and your vendors all the same with the utmost respect and the utmost care and that'll pay you back in spades. And I realized that's part of things too. It's not just treating our customers like gold and then abusing our employees and not paying our vendors on time. It's entire circle. And so if if something goes wrong and this recession hits, you can talk to your vendors who we have great relationships with and realize and can we change our term of payments. If sometimes we, we have to roll back a bit in the recession, that employees will do everything possible for you if you have true leadership instead of just management. And that really stuck with me. Nobody ever talked about that. Nobody ever said everybody is your customer, including vendors, including employees. And I, I love that. Scott, if you had to guess, because I'm, I'm really interested to know this, but if you had to guess on how many companies in in you know not, the world, United States, North America, whatever you want to say, that actually do the, the full, like you're saying, uh, the vendors, the employees, the customers, what percentage of companies do you think do that? I think um, the answer in a big company sense is one, but in a smart company, I really, here's the thing. It's funny, out of, like, as entrepreneurs or small business owners, I think we always set out and intend to do that. That I know for us that we're, we're a small company and we pay our vendors, not net 30, we pay them immediately. Hmm. When we get the invoice, it's paid. And they're like, it's, it's like we have a joke now that our, our record was a minute and a half for them getting the, the payment um, <laughs> from actually invoicing us. And we're trying to beat that now. I know we can try. It's our year this year. But I think as small businesses, we, we do that. We're quick. We're, we, we, appreciate, we appreciate customers, especially for we're a new business. It's exciting. And then sometime along the growth of the business, we start taking it for granted. We get a customer, a client. We're like, yeah, of course you're with us. You're supposed to be. That's the way it is. Mm. And then you start pushing out the payment terms. Then you start pushing because we want to do this and expand. And I think the size of the company can a lot of times affect how we're treating employees and then vendors and then customers as well. And it's just really hard, unless it's top-down driven, to drive that, not customer-focused, but people-focused. And it's not just lip service. It's everybody involved there. Yeah, I agree. I think that, that that's one difficult thing to scale. <laughs> right. It is because you can't you cannot treat everybody wonderfully while working for somebody who's a jerk. 
Yeah. No, that, that, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And Scott, this next thing that we're going to ask is, you know, everyone in, in a lot of different podcasts and, and interviews and that kind of stuff asks for a, a book suggestion, a recommendation. We're not asking for any, we're asking for the though, the recommendation. So if there was only <laughs> one book you could recommend to our listeners based on the way that it's impacted your life, maybe created a, uh, a lifestyle shift or a paradigm shift for you, what book mm. would you suggest? Uh, I gotta, I gotta dig deep. I gotta go way back to, uh, permission marketing by mm. Seth Godin. But 12 years ago, I wrote, I read that on, or 15 years ago, maybe I read that on a cross country flight from start to finish. And I wouldn't get off the plane until I finished it, which wow. became awkward, um, at the time, but <laughs> it changed my brain and permission marketing gave me permission to think the way I was thinking which means, oh, somebody else can think this way, which actually helped lead to unmarketing um, because I realized that there was other ways to do it. And um, so I, I got to give a hat tip to Seth Godin for that one. That is That was a brain-changing book. That's excellent. I'm adding that to my card as we speak because I think that's the one Seth Godin book that I don't already have. It's the one that started it all. So yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Well, excellent. Well, Scott, thank you so much for coming on. But before we do that, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to not only get more information on you, but also get more information on, on, you know, unselling or even some of your other books as well. Sure. Um, unmarketing is the handle of our world. So that's the website.com or Facebook, Twitter, even Instagram. I even downloaded Periscope for crying out loud. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold your breath on there though. And, uh, <laughs> there's an actual microsite for the book on selling the book.com. The on podcast is, um, our favorite thing in the world to do. So that can be seen at on podcast and search it in anywhere you listen. But we also do a video of it. So um, just go to uh, unpodcast.com and you'll see a video every week of the show. And uh, yeah, that's my will. And wherever fine books, ebooks or audiobooks are sold. Excellent. So easy to find you. And we'll put all those all those uh, resources and links in the show notes so that people can do just that. It's amazing because our audience is about 15 to 20% more mobile than the average, you know, uh, iTunes or, or, you know, podcast audience. So you can tell they're, they're busy, uh, productive entrepreneurs that are walking, running, do, doing whatever they're, they're in the midst of doing something right now. So, uh, so we'll Love put it. all that so they can go check it out. But Love Scott, it. again, thank you so much for coming on and sharing uh, your book with us. Thank you, Wade. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for listening in today. I, th I think, uh, or I hope that you got a ton out of that interview with Scott. And if you want more information on him or his book on selling, check out the show notes at the elpodcast.com. And as always, if you would like an opportunity to, uh, to win this book, uh, become a VIP, same website, the elpodcast.com. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.